everybody, welcome back to theclinicaltrialsguru.com. Again, it's theclinicaltrialsguru.com. Thank you for watching. If you're new, welcome. Thank you if you're an existing viewer. Thank you very much. It means a lot to me that you're watching. Make sure you subscribe both on YouTube and the blog, theclinicaltrialsguru.com, and Snapchat, all right? I do lots of Snapchat exclusive content. I post a few of them here on YouTube just to siphon off some of the audience for Snapchat because that's a growing platform. Um, so today's video is going to be centered around the entire process of a clinical trial from start to finish. And I'm going to kind of keep it brief, just very general overview. I've been getting a lot of questions from my CRA students, from my CRC students. I have a CRC Academy coming up. Uh, and from some of my clients who are brand new, they're just started their own research sites and they want to understand how the process works. So for, uh, for those of us in the industry, a lot of these things we already know, but for those that are thinking about getting into the industry, these are things that are rarely, if ever, discussed anywhere uh, outside of like rooms, private settings where people are having meetings and discussing these kind of things. So I wanted to do a video on this topic uh, to respond to all the questions. So. When a research site, when an investigator wants to get a study, they reach out to sponsors. Typically they go on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, sometimes they have their own contacts, like they, they reach out to their uh, pharmaceutical sales reps. If it's a physician at a private practice, usually the medical liaison is the best person, your best contact to reach out to to get you some studies uh, because the medical liaison is the link between the sales side of pharma teams and the R&D side of pharma organizations. So these medical liaisons are key contacts for you research sites looking to get more studies. So they reach out, they get studies, there are study brokers out there, which I don't necessarily like. Uh, I've used before, I don't like. Um, there's consultants, there's companies like mine which help sites get studies. Uh, so if you need help with that, give me a call. Uh, so you get studies to your site. You pitch, you send emails, you call, you fill out feasibility surveys, right? Once a sponsor thinks you're a good fit, they'll send you a CDA or an NDA, which is a non-disclosure agreement or a confidentiality disclosure agreement. Essentially, it's a secrecy agreement. They want to send you a protocol synopsis so that you can answer the feasibility survey for the study and I'm going to get into what a feasibility survey is so they'll send you a secrecy agreement someone from the site needs to sign it sends it back someone from the sponsor or CRO will sign it on their end now you have an executed CDA now they can send you the protocol synopsis which is basically like a cliff note version of what the protocol is because protocols are like 100 to 300 pages and a protocol synopsis is a condensed version of the protocol. They have usually the inclusion exclusion criteria, as well as the schedule of assessments, which essentially lets you know every single assessment at every visit that is going to be needed to be done as per the protocol, which is important because when you fill out the feasibility survey, which by the way, my company, if you're one of our clients, we do this for you, uh, you need to fill these feasibility surveys out. And it's very important how you answer these feasibility surveys because there are questions in there that will be used to determine whether you're going to be selected or not for the trial. And they ask very specific stuff such as therapeutic expertise, what is the standard of care for the, of the physician for patients who have this medical condition, how many studies have you done with this indication in the past, uh, how many subjects do you think you can enroll based on looking at the protocol synopsis, these kind of questions, all right? Once you fill that out, all the sites send in their feasibility surveys to the sponsors. The sponsors look it over. Uh, if they think that you're a good fit after looking at the feasibility survey, they will schedule a site selection visit, right? Also called an SSV or a PSSV. At the site selection visit, they're basically going to confirm whether the information on the feasibility survey is accurate right that's number one because most often it's not the PI that's filling out these feasibility surveys so the SSV is the opportunity for the CRA the monitor to meet with the PI and ask them what they think 
of their enrollment projections for the trial and whether they think they are still interested in participating in the trial. After that, they'll go through, ask for the GCP training, the IATA trainings of the coordinators, a CLIA waiver. They'll do a site tour where they're going to look at your calibration logs and your temperature logs, so make sure you have those in place. Uh, SSV typically takes between one to four hours, right? And the PI doesn't need to be there the entire time. The PI can be there for 30 minutes to 60 minutes, just going over the protocol with the CRA and then letting the CRA know whether they think they can enroll patients, how many patients, whether they're still interested in doing the trial. Okay, after the SSV, if that went well, and chances are, if they're already going out to your site for an SSV, unless you completely screw it up at the site selection visit, you're pretty much 90% already guaranteed the study when they decide to come out and do an SSV. They're just making sure that you you actually exist, that you actually have a site, that you didn't just open up yesterday or that morning, um, and that you actually can, can feasibly do the trial, right? That's the purpose of an SSV. So unless you completely botch that SSV, you're going to get the study. Now, you may be added as a backup site, and Chris and I did a video on this the other day. If they have too many sites in your specific geographic area, they might have you be an add-on site. And that's not the end of the world. An add-on site basically means you're a backup site. As soon as some of the sites that are active drop out because of numerous reasons, but primarily it's because of lack of enrollment, which is why it's important for you guys to start screening immediately, especially if it's competitive enrollment. Start screening, start showing the sponsor that you're producing some kind of activity um, or else you will get dropped. Okay, It's happened to me a few times early, early in my days when I was learning this stuff. So backup site, not the end of the world. You'll usually get added on as, an, as a regular site. Um, before you can start screening, you need to have a SIV, which is a site initiation visit. Uh, essentially, the, the monitor is going to come out and make sure you have passwords for all the vendor portals, like the EDC, the ECG portal, the labs, you have the lab kits, you have the investigational product on, on site, you have IVRS access, which is what you use to enroll, randomize, screen fail a subject. Uh, then they'll also look at your regulatory documents to see if everything's in order, if everything, all the regulatory documents have been signed and filed. I, uh, IRB approval for the consent form because you can't start screening subjects until you have an IRB approved consent form. Uh, IRB approval to start screening at your site, you need to have that. That's SIV. SIVs typically take eight hours because they go through literally everything to make sure that you can start screening the very next day. So after the SIV, sites can start screening subjects and you better start screening. If it's a competitive enrolling study and you haven't screened any subjects within the first four weeks, there's a good chance you might get dropped because these days time is money and sponsors are not playing around. They have backup sites ready to go like that. I always tell my sites, start screening immediately. Even if they screen fail, just start screening. Find some patients that will fit. Hopefully they randomize. This is how you don't get dropped, okay? During the study, you have all kinds of things. You have regular monitoring visits. You have database locks, which are essentially when parts of the EDC system are going to be completely source data verified. All queries answered. EDC signed off on certain patients. And then you move on to the next subjects. This goes on throughout the course of the study, throughout the course of the trial. Then you have the closeout visit. Okay, this is essentially the opposite of the SIV. All the IPs returned, um, databases are all locked, all EDCs are signed off on, IRB closeout form has been submitted, and the this, this site status is now closed as per the IRB. Uh, archives, okay, they're gonna ask you where are you planning to store your medical records, because you need to store them from anywhere from 5 to 30 years after the trial's over based on the based on various sponsors. Each sponsor has different requirements based on where they're from in the world. So U.S. sponsors are typically shorter 
uh, time frames for keeping records. European sponsors and Japanese sponsors much longer. Okay, and um, you have to know that before going into the trial when you negotiate the contract and budget, which is also another service that my consulting group provides. But you have to find out how long you're going to need to store these archives because guess what? Storage costs are not cheap. And who can predict how much it's going to cost 20 years from now in 2036? All right, you're still going to have to be paying that. That's the PI's responsibility. So that's important. Uh, and then after the closeout visit, essentially nothing else happens. You're sent a CD-ROM. You're still sent a CD-ROM. I, I, I imagine in the future you'll be sent something else, but for now it's a CD-ROM that has all the data from the EDC. And hopefully, if you did a good job with very few protocol deviations and you entered your data in a timely manner, the sponsor and the CRO will consider you for other trials, and then the process repeats over and over and over again. All right, but your first studies always the hardest. Make sure you don't screw up. Um, thanks for watching, Dan from the Clinical Trials Guru.com. Send me your questions. Thank you.